<laughs> uh, we have a real treat, because um, our third uh, uh, nature game uh, changer really has changed the game when it comes to understanding of nature and its link in particular with the economy. Uh, so Sapatha Descriptor's uh, 2021 uh, review of the economics of biodiversity really was a signature publication, much for the UK, but globally actually, in, in changing the, the terms uh, of the debate. And as, as Jules mentioned, uh, Partha has already had a, several shout outs uh, today by the prior speakers, uh, including Henry Dimbleby, who said, Partha, uh, that you were the cleverest man he had ever hugged. Um, um, <laughs> praise indeed for Henry. He has, um, he has low standards. <laughs> Um, please join in me in welcoming Sabatha Descriptor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Partha, I want to start, I want to start way back actually. I want to start, start way back 300 years ago, which was the birth of Adam Smith. He's 300 years old, as you know, um, this yep. year. Prominent RSA fellow, I should hasten to point out. Um, for many, the founding father of the economics profession mm -hmm. that we're both a part of. How is it, Partha, the economics profession neglected nature as part of the wealth of nations for so long, do you think? Uh, that's a tough one, largely because I'm quite innocent of the history of my subject. Um, history of economic thought is not something I have um, entered into. But I think there is a charitable um, explanation, um, which is that locally there are, have been environmental problems and there's much that was written, I think, in the 19th century over pollution in London, you know, sewage and so forth, and then the Thames about to burn with toxic waste and so forth. But there is a generous, uh, interpretation in as much as globally um, the human economy was not very large relative to the biosphere until relatively recently, and I'll come back to that as to how recently it is. It's striking that one can be quite precise about it, by the way. Um, so you might think that if we are small fry, and it's a huge amount of stuff out there, Mother Nature is huge, all-embracing. Well. We can, she's generous enough, so we don't cost her when we take things. We don't pay for it. So, globally. Locally, of course, the matter is different. And where societies fell under, they were not really recorded, because that happened in Latin America, or you know, the Mayans disappeared, or the Icelandic. And that came to light, at least, um, globally, much very recently with paleoecology, the data are now much firmer than they were before. It's not hearsay anymore. You, there are signatures in the soil and ice and so forth. Um, but globally, we were small. And of course, the birth of economics, namely these islands here, they had outsourced their need for biodiversity as we still do. So when the economist tells us that, uh, which she, the economist does that on a weekly basis, that the environmental laws here are strangulating economic growth, um, because what's there if you eat into another bat family for building purposes and so forth, it can get away with it because uh, our economy doesn't really depend on the biodiversity of this country. It, uh, it matters to us as householders, of course. You worry about your garden. We all do. And the lack of uh, um, parks in the neighborhood and so forth. But the GDP can keep on growing, at least for a while, continue to grow because we are basically importing the stuff, the primary products from Africa, Latin America, South Asia. And that's where the biodiversity loss is being felt. And we're not paying for it. I'll come back to that, too, if you want to. So there's a perverse uh, set of indicators that 
So that, that may be a reason. Now, things changed enormously after the Second World War because the data are now, it's one of those rare occasions where economic data fit in very well with uh, geophysical data. They're, geophysicists now, the Earth scientists rather, they regard 1950 as being the year, you know, as a totem, uh, where we entered the Anthropocene. And the point is that economic activity, if you measure it in terms of GDP, global GDP, so that that's a measure of economic activity, not necessarily economic well-being, but activity, then that really shot up from about 1950. I mean, the, uh, from year one CE to 1950, it was up to 1750 or so per capita, in global GDP per capita was pretty stagnant. I mean, fluctuations obviously go without saying in a 200, 2000 year or 1700 year uh, uh, period. But on the whole, it was uh, constant. People were poor for most of, most of the last 2,000 years. It took off with the Industrial Revolution, but nothing substantial until, as I say, it really took off about 1950. And uh, GDP has grown by a factor of 15, or multiple of 15, in uh, 70 years. So there's been a huge pressure on, on the end. But for some reason, and I think I also, since you asked me <laughs> about I do know about our habits of economists, if, even if I don't know the history of economic thought. Like many other disciplines, we tend to, most economists work on the last paper they read. And then you, you want to improve upon it, obviously. You want to show, you know, you need tenure or, or PhD or whatever. It's sort of standard. There's nothing wrong with it. This is exactly right. This is, but if you have neglected nature all this, you've got to follow a trajectory of inquiry, uh, which you're fine-tuning as you move on. There are new questions you ask, but it's uh, around that trend. Historians call it path dependency. It's a term that you probably have heard um, of. So I think that has enabled uh, contemporary growth and development economics and the economics of poverty to essentially neglect nature. Now, um, final remark about that, and that is that um, we forget. I mean, you might think the way I'm describing things, this is academic stuff. Journals like the Economic Journal, American Economic Review, what the hell has that got to do with you know, people's perceptions? But I think you'd be quite wrong in thinking so, that they are deeply connected because the entire language we use as citizens, not as economists, but as citizens, is shaped by what, you, what we read in newspapers, magazines, general conversations, and utterances of politicians. And decision makers today were yesterday students, many of whom were actually economic, economic students. So the synergy between what's going on in academic economics and our conception of economic possibilities of the future is, is quite powerful in my judgment until it's sort of rattled with the evidence. And I guess that my, that's where my review comes in. And on, you, on your review, I mean, um, a couple of years on now, uh, tell me, um, what's going well? What's changed off the back of the review? And, and what as importantly, is going less well? What have been the disappointments so far, at least, in, in what's been picked up? Well, thank you. The, um, well, first of all, I should say that the review is it's not, a, um, it's not new economics. It's very orthodox economics, largely because my subject is a fabulous one, the language that we're given from Adam Smith onwards. And we have some towering people teachers of mine. Uh, so it, it's the misuse of economics, is, of the language, that's the criticism, not the, the, the tools that we have. So I was very, there's nothing, the economics in it has not been criticized by anybody. Absolutely not. There's not a single, um, I mean, I think there's one article which was very critical of it on, on, on not YouTube and Google, I guess. 
not been published or anything like that. But then that's for theological reasons. It was, uh, doesn't like more economics at all. So, um, but otherwise, no, the, that hasn't been questioned at all. And uh, I like to think that's because the economic reasoning is sound. It's, it's okay. And then, of course, it's backed up by the ecological input. Ecologists have had a lot to do with it on the review. I've been taught by some of the great masters of ecology, so that's worked all right. So what's gone well? One of the recommendations was that we should move away from using GDP as a measure of economic well-being and economic progress. This is not to say we shouldn't use GDP because it is an indicator of economic activity. And uh, for short-run macroeconomic policy, you want, want to know, you know, our, our, uh, you know how much of waste is there now. So that's a very reasonable thing to do. But for long run, medium to long run assessments of the progress or regress of an economy, it really is not just wrong, it's deadly wrong. It's deadly wrong because, among other things, it misses out on the depreciation of capital assets that are come together with rise in, with economic activity. Now for buildings, and uh, human capital is the easiest one in some sense because it's predictable. We will all die taking our human capital with us, <laughs> knowledge and so forth. So you can account for that. That's not a problem. Uh, for buildings and roads and everything, well, there are standard methods of estimating at what rate they're depreciating, and you keep depreciation allowances so for repair works, replacement, and so forth. So that's included, uh, largely because they're not, they may be 2 3% a year or something. And that can be accommodated. But Mother Nature is different. We can actually wipe her out locally, uh, the drop of a hat, or by the plugging in the chainsaw, or whatever, or the running a bulldozer across. So you can depreciate nature. I mean, destroy nature is the better way of putting it. Um, even while GDP is growing, and you wouldn't, of course, notice it because the statistics won't give you any details of it, especially if it's happening elsewhere, by the way, which is where I began. So, um, the, so what should, now the crit criticism that GDP is bad news as a goal, it's, it's been around for quite a long time. The trick was to find some, something to replace it with, one that would conform with the idea of human well-being. And there is an index, which is wealth. And you asked me about Adam Smith. Well, I may not know anything about the history of economic thought, but I do know he wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations. And the only thing is that the notion of wealth that I was advocating, and with others that I have, whom I, whom I published papers, is richer than Adam Smith's, because it includes nature, ecosystems, as capital assets. So that's been the innovation. So I won't go into it any further, but the idea is to track the wealth of nations. Now, that's been a success that in the following sense, um, uh, our statistical offices in many of the countries like UK, Chile, China, J uh, Japan, Australia, they're adopting now uh, satellite accounts of the states of the environment or natural capital, as you can call it, okay? We, can't, we won't go into the way how you measure it, but the idea is to see whether it's improving or deteriorating. And if it's deteriorating, that's a depreciation that's being missed in the GDP. So that's a success in the sense that maybe the time was right. It's not because of the review. It was, it was in the air and it's gone, gone well. Sec the, what hasn't gone well? Well, um, we subsidize nature, the use of nature to the tune, globally, to the tune of five to seven trillion dollars a year, which is something like five to six percent of global GDP. So that means it's not only, Mother Nature is not only free to, to be used, but she has a negative, comes with a negative price. So you can see the, you know, it's sort of a really a mandate for, uh, you know, assaulting nature. And I think you discussed that at Henry Dimbleby's farm subsidies and so forth, that's related. So, and that's not about to be removed, but if it does so, it'll be very... But the sad thing is that economists really aren't working on the implications of their removal, because there'll be a huge distributional 
changes that will take place. The direction of technological change will um, be affected naturally because if Mother Nature is treated as though she's valuable, the new knowledge, new technology will be there to, will direct us to economize on her use, not to plunder her further, okay? So there's a huge, implica uh, huge implications which haven't been studied, are not being studied. And in any case, this policy hasn't come to fruition. So that's been one. A second disappointment, um, and I'm saying it only because it will suggest to you how far we really need to broaden our conception of economic possibilities, is over the open oceans, open seas. They're common property resources. They used to be called the common heritage of mankind in the 1970s, if I remember correctly. And they're open access, they're free. You know, trillions of dollars of merchandise are shipped across the oceans, but nobody's paying a rent, a rental charge for the use of that property because nobody owns it, which means, of course, the pressure on the oceans is high, quite apart from the fishing, deep sea fishing, pollution, Dead, dead zones that we are creating, all come because we are treating her as a free good. So one, the suggestion that I'd made was that we should try and think of a, uh, have a international <coughs> body created with a view to monitoring its use and having the power to tax the use of the nation, the observable use of the oceans. And crude, crude calculations suggest we could raise you know, it's double digit, maybe even more billions of dollars per year because the traffic is huge. What do we do with that money? One possibility, of course, I mean, development purposes and so forth, because it will be a global fund, not any particular countries, because the oceans belong to all of us. One thought was that we should negotiate with countries which house our home to the tropical rainforests because they supply a public good, like, among other things, maintaining biodiversity and the climate. And the thought here was that we complain from outside that the size of Portugal is being lost every year in Brazil. But the Brazilians can come back, at, and they, the president did say until, until last year, before the last election, but why should Brazil be responsible for the whole world? It's a global public good, but our territory is our territory, and we are going to develop, we want to develop, and the way to develop, given the public demand for meat, is cattle farms, and uh, soybean plantations, and so forth. And that's why we are cutting down the... And you can't, uh, there's a logic behind it, we may not like it, but there's logic behind it. So the idea is that you negotiate a payment system, as we now do here, locally, with farmers, you pay farmers for. So the idea is, again, payment for ecosystem services. Um, now, I've had many conversations with international decision makers on this uh, since my review was published. And they all said, yeah, it's a very nice idea, but you know the world doesn't have a appetite for such an undertaking, another, yet another international institute. So I have to point out that after the Second World War, when Europe was on her knees, and East Asia was completely sh shattered. We created the UN, World Bank, IMF, all the UN subsidiaries, and you name it, um, Marshall Plan. But we don't seem to have that kind of um, boldness of thought. So that's been a disappointment. Well, not yet. I want the audience <laughs> to collect some questions, because uh, time is uh, short. Who'd like to uh, pop a question to, to Papa on this fascinating Fascinating uh, area. There we go. We'll start at Tanya Rabat. Uh, Partha, thank you very much for, for sharing um, the summary of all the work you've done over a long period of time. You've, you've just um, finished almost with a provocation in terms of if we were to almost reinvent the, the Bretton Woods movement, if you like, in terms of the establishment of institutions. Uh, or indeed create some form of global Marshall Plan. So there's no doubt that the US and Western powers created that before. If, if you were king for a year or for a day, 
where do you think that sort of focus might come from in the world to almost create that new Marshall Plan? Uh, and where would you sit down? Who would you sit down with to, to uh, recommend this? I wouldn't accept king, kingship precisely because I, I'm incompetent. To, I really can't comment on that because I wouldn't know where to begin. I wouldn't know what to look for. I don't, uh, I like to think because I, I've always lived in democratic societies that this, this is where the likely action is. Uh, there is still some idealism left. Um, but, and when I, when I say that it hasn't received much support, I should say that it was with some regret I heard. The, the voices I heard back was one of regret, not sort of, the, you know, this is pie in the sky or anything. It's not pie in the sky, it's pure economics. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a pub, you know, public good and it's not being pro you know, a common pro property resource and it's not, it's used, it's not being uh, paid for. And that just, you know, element, first year economics. So it's nothing, it's nothing deep about it. It's just that thinking about it, it certainly s struck me that the amount of attention we pay to the atmosphere as a sink for carbon. And that's also a common property resource and that's why we have these climate agreements and so forth. The comparable discussion hasn't uh, ensued over the oceans. No, I wouldn't know. I mean, I like, still like to think that it will be the Western countries which will generate it, but uh, not at the moment, I don't think. Yeah. Time for one more uh, question. We'll take it just here. Thank you. Hi, Papa. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, one uh, statement you made was that GDP should not be the only measure of progress, and it doesn't include certain costs. I wanted to ask, do you have any suggestions on a more holistic way of measuring Sorry, progress? Sorry, suggestion? Do you have any suggestions on another way of measuring Oh, yes. I was progress? actually uh, hinting. I mean, I was uh, obviously because of time limitation, I can't elaborate on it. Uh, what you, there, there is one which is completely kosher. I mean, this is, it's built on a theorem. It's not just, you know, I haven't plucked it out of the air and saying this is what's good. You want to be able to prove that it, car it moves in the same way as human well-being does. It's a measure, a social value of social worth of the set of all assets that the economy has access to. And that we, can, we would call that wealth because wealth is the value of your assets. But this one is more extensive than normal notions of wealth because it includes a natural capital, okay? And uh, that, that can be, and it's what the, in, in, what the national statisticians are doing are, are not to, in, and I think wisely, not to estimate the wealth of, the, say, the UK. Instead, they're focusing attention on one component of wealth, the one component which is missing in any conception of wealth that's cu currently deployed, namely natural capital. And I think that's a good move, that's correct, because it focuses attention on the most vulnerable set of assets that a country, that, that, that we have access to. And of course, it needs to be compared to the growth, let's say, in human capital, produced capital, that's for sure. An idea would be to add them up and then see whether on balance it's growing, and if it is, that will be like a sustainable development index. That's exactly right. That would be correct, and that can be proved to be the case. We call it inclusive wealth. Now, one institution is doing the inclusive wealth calculation for, all the, for a set of 150 countries or so. Extremely crude, goes without saying. This, these are early days for it. And that's the United Nations Environment Program. They're producing now a biennial, biennial report, the uh, inclusive wealth report, uh, to track uh, inclusive wealth, this notion of wealth across. So that's been a success. It'll, it'll be refined over the years, goes without saying. But that's, that's the idea. You move away from income to wealth. Pana, final um, yeah. question from me. So the theme of today yeah. is, is what could go right. For us to be optimistic. Uh, yes. I'd love you to leave us uh, all in the room and online with some optimism about how we can do a better job with nature than we have over the past 300 years and counting. Yeah, and I think here, I, I, I do feel optimistic about it, but largely because I think I've got a very biased set of signals I receive. I live in the UK, 
and um, which is very uh, far more progressive than many, most many other societies I can think of. But we like to think on these economic matters invariably in terms of the central government as the agency. And in my review, I wasn't, although it was commissioned by the Treasury, UK Treasury, and they supported it extensively, very well, I'm very grateful to them. But the review wasn't written for the Treasury. I was addressing the citizen. Uh, that's absolutely clear right from the beginning. Right? Uh, from, and it seems to me that's where really the action is because for a variety of reasons. But since you ask, it's a deep question you've asked. Uh, and, I mean, I'm trying to give an answer which responds to the depth of the question. I, the action really is not so much the government. It should be in a democratic society. It'll be a reflection of what the, uh, the citizens want. But the reason that citizens are particularly important here is that nature is very mobile. And we know that, but there are some consequences of it. One is that we, what we do affects people at a different time at a different location. And uh, that's one reason. And so we care about what others are doing, or we should care about what others are doing. It's not something that we should necessarily take for granted. It's something we can negotiate over, just as we were, I was talking about the Brazilian rainforest. That's the kind of interaction that we need. Um, and secondly, the reason it's important, why we as citizens it's important, is that many of Mother Nature's processes are silent and they're invisible. Now, think through what that might mean. It means that you can't depend only on the legal system to, to, to control, the, or to, 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 to uh, advise us on our behavior. Uh, we don't steal, because we might, well, partly because we don't want to steal, that's, that's for sure, but there's a deterrence effect, if you like. There's a police out there, there's a legal system. Things could go wrong, I might get caught, and I go into prison. That's a deterrence thing. Uh, in traditional societies, you didn't quite have the law, but you had social norms of behavior. You get, you get if you're not spanked, you get socially sanctioned if you're doing things which are antisocial. And antisocial here could be taking too much fish from the pond or taking too, many, too much timber or taking more water from the, res, from the pond than, this, than you're entitled to. So there are rules and regulations which have guided our use of Mother Nature's resources throughout, society, throughout history, goes without saying. Uh, but when it's silent and invisible, those processes can't be either monitored by anybody else but yourself. So it, it's a sort of, I end with the plea that we really need a education system where we, we treat nature, we feel something's wrong in our mistreating nature when nobody is looking, even when no one's looking, okay. So I have hopes because if I, th if I think there's more and more uh, engagement with the fact that the, our customary economic policies have Many other ills, of course, but amongst the gravest ills is our treatment of nature. Then it'll be we who will, who will direct uh, public decision makers, because we do have the tools. That's not a problem. It's not as though we're, you know, there's a pandemic and nobody knows what the virus is. That's not, it's, that's not true. We, have, we are very much in command of the information uh, of social institutions that are required, in, which includes education, by the way. So the review actually ends with a plea for a reform of our education system to introduce na nature studies from primary school onwards up to the end of our education. Uh, the hope is that in some sense, just we like learn to read and write, uh, we ought to know something about and count. Um, we need to understand something about what's going on our, under our feet. Please join me in thanking the wonderful Sapatha Descobdar.